Yeah, this book really doesn't constitute as light reading. Alien Bodies is regarded by some as one of the best books in the EDA range. It introduces a few reoccurring arcs and characters in the series, and has some incredible ideas and clever concepts that were remarkably executed. I honestly didn't know what to think when coming into reading this book. I've read some interesting books in the EDA range so far, but not something along these lines. I might go so far as to say I like this book so much that it might well ruin a lot of Doctor Who media for me, as I can now see how far writers can take the series and plots. Lawrence Miles was the author of this book, and he was known at this point for being a reoccurring author of The Virgin New Adventures. Yes, it is a common theme with the EDA range taking writers that have already written for Doctor Who in that series. You see, Peter Darvall Evans, the editing and production manager of The Virgin New Adventures, had pressure of continuing the show in book form, but people's morale of Doctor Who was very low at this point, and the general consensus at the time was the show will not be returning. This meant that he could get away with a few new, inexperienced writers and follow a really experimental style, moulding the show into something no one had really seen before, and probably won't again. When the TV movie hit screens, people were certain this show was going to make a return, making Doctor Who a more lucrative option to invest money into. This is why the BBC took the move to bring back publishing to themselves, and start producing the EDA and PDA range of books. They had to be more careful about who they picked to write for them, however, as the show was much more likely to come back on air, and they wanted the books to be the best quality possible, especially in the first wave of releases. This is where Lawrence Miles comes in. As he had previously written three titles for Virgin, he too was a good bet to start off the EDA range of books. The base premise of the story is that the Doctor finds himself gate crashing an auction held on Earth between various different aliens, only to find out that the relic that they're bidding for is his own dead body. The reason these aliens are bidding for the Doctor's body is because his DNA contains elements that can be used for weaponry, namely his DNA contains details of the Matrix. There are many different bidders at the auction, the Crotons arrive to cause havoc, a dead man called Trask, a Time Lord from the future, two human soldiers, an idea-based life form called the Shift, and some members of the Faction Paradox. The Faction Paradox are a sort of voodoo type cult that split from Time Lords and worship paradoxes. Needless to say, these guys don't get along with Time Lords, and frictions between them break out a couple of times, leading to fights and squabbles. After a lot of exposition, all the bidders place their bid, but the Croton was unhappy with the auctioneer's reaction to its bid, so decides to try and take the relic by force. The Doctor then realises that the shift, the idea-based life form, is getting into all of their heads, making all the bidders turn on each other and causing all of the violence. The Doctor also discovers that Trask is in fact working for the Celestis, who are a future version of the Celestial Intervention Agency. After some complicated altercations involving another dimension called Mictlan, where the Celestes watch over our universe, the Doctor then defeats the Shift and the Crotons and takes his body back to a planet to be buried and destroyed. It is hinted, however, that the shady auctioneer might have been pulling a scam on the buyers all along, and the relic might not actually be the Doctor's body. This is really open to interpretation, however, as there's evidence throughout the book that says it both is and isn't the Doctor's body, so I think the author wanted to keep this one kind of a bit open. This book is a really heavy read, and you best be paying close attention to all the subplots as they all come together and mean something. This is probably one of the book's greatest strengths. It wraps everything up very neatly whilst giving some plot points and introducing themes that will be continued into later novels. One of these themes is a large-scale war that is taking place between the Time Lords and another race of creatures known only as the Enemy, far in the Doctor's future. A lot of the plot revolves around this idea and is continued in a lot of future books. At this point, we don't know an awful lot about this war, but I like to think it could be the last great time war in the new series, or at the very least, a time war before that, as the title The Last Great Time War suggests that there have been previous wars fought. I found the idea of this future looming war a really engaging and original idea for a subplot, and it was interesting to see the Time Lord's character motivations being deeply affected by this war at the auction. Another theme introduced briefly was the Dark Sam story arc. Dark Sam is someone that reoccurs later in the book series, so I'm not going to give too much away, but in this book, Sam seems to have two sets of biodata, one that travels with the Doctor and one who ends up being a drug user that is not involved with the Doctor at all. The Doctor cottons onto this straight away and becomes a bit suspicious of Sam, saying she's a bit too perfect to be a companion. This 
part feels a bit shoehorned in and is only really a brief mention, so I'm not going to spend any more time on it. So the faction paradox is also introduced for the first time in this novel, and I really, really liked them. I was very sceptical of their idea at first, but this book shows how utterly terrifying these beings can be. At one point, one of the members who was unsuccessful in the mission was sent back in time to kill himself, causing an eternal paradox. The cousin stepped forward, his legs moving of their own accord. The room ahead was his own room, in the orphanage. In front of them there was a bed, and in the bed lay an eight-year-old boy. Cousin Sanjira heard the humming of the shrine in his ears, and he knew the spirits had brought him here. For the briefest of moments, Sanjira saw himself as the boy saw him, a figure in a blood-tainted robe, his face the skull of a bat. But the cousin moved into the side of the bed, and raised the knife. A scar of silver unfolding from his gown. This was his punishment. Sanjira, aged 50, stabbed the boy clean through the heart. Young Sanjira, aged 8, cried out once and died. But if young Sanjira died, then cousin Sanjira had never existed, which meant that this could have never killed the boy, which meant he did exist, which meant he could have killed the boy, which meant he never existed, which meant he couldn't have killed the boy, which meant he did exist, which meant... Cousin Sanjira murdered the child, and himself was murdered again and again and again. He felt his life being disassembled and reassembled, disassembled and reassembled, disassembled and reassembled until the timeline swallowed his entire line. And there was nothing left of him but divine and perfect paradox. Damn, that's pretty sinister, and I can't wait to see these guys in future books. They're really gnarly and creepy, which gives the book a much more sinister tone. It adds a lot of atmosphere, and like I said, I just can't wait to see them again. This book amazes me with its sheer imagination. I would love to spend a day in Lawrence Miles' head just to see how he came up with some of these ideas just thrown around in this book. The most amazing idea has to be when Sam discovers the relic, only to then be mentally tortured by the defence system surrounding it. They were tormented by flowers made of flesh, their own heads protruding from the flowers with black eyes. It was seriously disgusting and traumatising just reading those scenes. Another cool idea was the Time Lord from the future whose companion actually turned out to be his TARDIS. It's well known that the TARDISes are sentient beings, but uh, in this book it suggests that the future Time Lords make their TARDISes even more sentient. Are you sure you didn't just fall off it? Homunculus gave her his best scowl. Open up, he said. Marie sighed, then drew a line across her face with her finger, from the centre of her forehead to the tip of her chin. Her head opened up obligingly. The crack unfolded into a doorway big enough to accommodate a decent-sized humanoid. Homunculate vanished inside her interior and her face folded itself back into the usual configuration behind him. Seconds later, she dematerialized with a wheezing, groaning sound. I just love the spark behind a lot of this author's ideas and it is so refreshing to see. So, the Crotons are also in this book, which is a bit of a surprise, considering they're quite frankly a ridiculous looking enemy, and they look like they've been cobbled together by a five-year-old child. I understand the budget restrictions back in Patrick Troughton's era, but still, they look terrible. However much I thought it was weird bringing these guys back, I absolutely adored them in this book. Lawrence Miles really added a whole new dimension to these enemies, making them a shape-shifting telepathic crystalline creature rather than a basic bog-standard monster of the week like their source material. This book had a lot of subplots and minor story points, but Miles does a great job of balancing these elements perfectly and making sure the plot is moving forward and makes sense. This is an important book in the EDA canon, and it cannot be skipped, which makes it such a relief that it's a fun and interesting read. Each bidder gets a whole chapter's worth of exposition each, which helps bring the characters alive and gives a chance to take a break from the complex themes of the book. If you can't already tell, I absolutely adored this one. The ideas in this book alone make it stand out, but the meld of continuity points and perfect pacing really makes this stand out as one of the best Doctor Who books I've read. The only fault I have with this book is that the writing style just wasn't for me at times, but that's a personal thing and I can see why some people really like that style of writing. I have to give this one a 10 out of 10. Fantastic book. Please just order it now.
Okay, so that concludes today's book review. I really, really enjoyed Alien Bodies, and I advise anyone and everyone to go ahead and get this book. Um, if you did enjoy the content, please leave a like or subscribe if you want to see more of it. And uh, yeah, make sure to have a fantastic day. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>